So welcome everybody. Thanks for being here. This is on Zoom and live with people in the audience. So we're going to be looking back and forth. If you could mute yourself if you're not already muted. And we'll have some people probably entering the gallery as we proceed. But um, in the meantime, I'd like to get started by saying the Friends of Sheldon Jackson Museum and Sheldon Jackson Museum would like to acknowledge and express our appreciation to the indigenous people of Tlingit Ani who have occupied this land for longer than any of us can imagine. And after 250 years of colonization in Alaska are graciously allowing us to share this amazing land with them. Thank you. Welcome to the opening reception of Filling Empty Spaces, Attraction and Distraction, an exhibition of new works by Robert Hoffman. This event is sponsored by the Friends of Sheldon Jackson Museum. Please join us for light refreshments in the temporary exhibition area and take in the beautiful artwork after Robert's talk. Robert will also be presenting via PowerPoint images of the works in the show. So if you're not here physically, you still get to see them. Robert Davis Hoffman is originally from Cake. He is primarily a wood carver and painter, but has worked in multimedia sculpture and has recently been experimenting with casting. He is represented by the Stonington Gallery in Seattle, Washington, and his works can be found in private collections and museum collections, including the Sheldon Jackson Museum. In his artist statement, Hoffman says, through his carvings and paintings, Hoffman explores cultural values and to what ends they drive us in search for fulfillment. In addition to being a visual artist, Hoffman is an accomplished poet. His published works include Soul Catcher, Village Boy, Poems of Cultural Identity, and his most recent book of poetry, Raven's Echo, just published by the prestigious Arizona Press, Suntracks Edition. Hoffman has also illustrated both books in the Raven House Mouse book series written by Jan Steinbright, who is in the audience. Robert Hoffman is one of three artists selected for the Sheldon Jackson Museum 2020 to 2023 solo artist exhibition series. The other artists included Ali High, who's an Athabascan artist, um, excuse me, who's a, a Lutic and Ali, we hosted her last year and Peter Williams, um, a wonderful Yupik skin sewer the year before. The proposal for the exhibition was selected by a panel from over a dozen applications. Filling empty spaces will be on exhibit at the Sheldon Jackson Museum until April 22nd, 2023. And images in the show will also be posted on the Alaska State Museum website and an online publication section. And a recording of this talk will be uploaded to the Friends of Sheldon Jackson Museum's YouTube channel, where there's already a host of other wonderful talks. Admission to the reception, artist talk, and exhibit are free today, January 14th, but will be charged hereafter. The next solo show exhibition series will take place in 2023 after an open call is issued. And without further delay, I'm very happy to introduce Robert Hoffman. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Jackie. Thanks for everybody for coming and uh, for both audiences. I'll try to uh, make it a habit to um, address both audiences. Um, my voice is kind of weird today. I get, I get really uh, thin voiced when I get nervous and I don't know why I'm nervous. Maybe it's because <clears throat> like Jackie and I were talking about this, uh, the show has been a long time coming. And uh, a year ago, I thought last year was the year that my show was supposed to be. And I was getting all snippy with everybody because I was, thought I was under so much pressure and uh, turned out to be a year early, but, um, <clears throat> but that gave me an opportunity to put more time into the pieces and, and not, not feel pressure and, and think about uh, exactly what, what the um, show was gonna be about. Um, uh, <clears throat> I'll, I'll pull up the slideshow here and... Um, and then... Let's see, I'm gonna figure out how to. Zoom so they see it. And then share screen. No way. There we go. 
And I also don't want to show the next slide here. Okay. So um, <clears throat> the idea, I'm actually going to read this because I, I wrote quite a bit here that I didn't want to forget. <clears throat> the idea for this exhibition came from my own struggle with identity. Um, and it led me to question things by uh, when, we're, when we're searching for identity or meaning, uh, trying to figure out those uh, bigger questions in life, um, we tend to become attracted to things and, and some of those things are actually uh, misguiding. Um, and so these are all about <clears throat> my own life lessons but I wanted to put a show together that, uh, <clears throat> that I could illustrate in our, traditional, uh, in our traditional art style, but that would address larger themes that everyone can relate to, not just a native audience. And uh, I've always, um, <clears throat> I, I, the, the idea for this exhibition came from uh, me, struggling with identity because of growing up half native. You wouldn't believe the amount of pain that caused me <laughs> and the conflicts, uh, the struggles. And it, uh, <clears throat> it led me to um, ask myself questions like, what is nativeness? And is blood quantum a factor in my nativeness? What is culture? Uh, what do I use as a guide for living? And, and uh, so many questions arose that um, I, I used this exhibition uh, as a vehicle to, uh, to provide answers that I arrived at. And um, <clears throat> my constant seeking uh, a solution to my discomfort made me feel like something was missing. And that's where uh, I get the uh, title for this show, Filling Empty Spaces. I began to look at what I pursue in life and how it fits into filling something missing. And we're, we're all enculturated to the beliefs we hold, to the values and, um, and our own pursuits. This comes out of our enculturation. And I realized that these things are intertwined, our beliefs, our values and pursuits. And we grew up in a capitalistic society. So we value money, property and prestige. And we're, uh, we're all compensating for something. And the, our motives are pretty revealing when we take a good look at them. So as I was making each one of these pieces, <clears throat> I made a list of the th different things that I struggled with and the different ways that I compensate or overcompensate for what I feel is lacking in me. So I used this show as a way to deconstruct myself and to look at what things I have misguidedly pursued. And those things turn out to be the, uh, the one wall with the picture frames and the titles for those frames are credentials, wealth, status, religion, consumption, technology, and addiction. All the things that I have tried to fill myself with over time. Um, a <clears throat> little bit about me. Um, I already mentioned I'm half native. Both my parents were teachers. My mother was white. Uh, she was a teacher from Michigan. My father was full-blooded Thinket from Cape. And uh, we traveled back and forth. And uh, that, what better way to feel like an outsider than to be half native in a white society or half native in a Thinket village? And so it, these, these things just kept um, building up in me. And, and uh, when, when I was told 
that I wasn't native, you know, kids can be cruel. <clears throat> a lot of times I was told I wasn't a real Indian. And, and so those, those uh, things stuck with me and sent me on this search. Uh, <clears throat> so my, uh, my art career uh, started when I was in fourth grade. I, I used to I used to love to watch my father carve model totems, which he learned here at the, uh, Sheldon Jackson High School. And uh, I, <clears throat> I wanted to be like that. I wanted to uh, learn things that I saw him doing. And I saw that it, uh, it seemed to bring him joy. And, and so when I started practicing these things, it seemed to bring him joy. And, and, and that pleased me. Uh, um, so, so I continued doing those things be, because it helped me feel like I was doing something that, uh, that emphasized my nativeness. So I got, uh, I started heading down the road uh, as, a, as a native artist early on. Uh, <clears throat> this exhibition, I, I told you about uh, the ideas behind it. Um, it's, uh, I, I wanted to explore our cultural values and how it's our values that drive us <clears throat> in, in our search for fulfillment. And, uh, you know, we all get our values from uh, from being enculturated fr from the homes we grew up in, the schools we attend, uh, the so societies we live in. And uh, I, I really wanted this show to be not just about emptiness and its counterpart fulfillingness, uh, but but I wanted <clears throat> but I wanted uh, to examine cultural values things that are important, things that shape us. So there's, there's two, um, <clears throat> two walls out in the gallery, and one wall is a series of picture frames. All the picture frames have nothing in them. I, <clears throat> for, for a while, I wanted to print uh, photographic paper with just a black dot in the center to represent a hole inside that we're trying that I was trying to fill, but then I I thought uh, I, I looked at uh, the the frames after we uh, started hanging them and I thought these these should be empty because it's more literal and uh, so the frames each frame represents a different kind of emptiness. I got the idea for carving picture frames. Over 10 years ago, there were some tourists who uh, were, they said they searched all over Alaska for carved picture frames and asked me if I would do that for them. <clears throat> Their last name happened to be Crane, C-R-E-A-N. And so they wanted me to design cranes, the bird cranes. So that's uh, this one here is the very first picture frame I carved. It's carved out of yellow cedar, and there's a there's a crane, there's a salmon, and the other uh, um, raven and eagle on top. Um, but that got me started on a whole series of picture frames. Uh, this one on the right, I did for my I did for my brother-in-law in Cape. Uh, one of his clan crests is the hummingbird. So these are two two. Oops. These are two hummingbirds on top and uh, coho on bottom. So the first picture frame in the series <clears throat> is about credentials and the motive behind seeking credentials I listed as seeking identity. I got this idea when I caught myself introducing myself as my job, like many of us do, or, or 
one of the first questions we ask people we're meeting, well, what do you do? And we tend to think of that as who we are, or I did anyway. And I began introducing myself as, um, hi, I'm Robert. I'm a counselor at Bill Brady Healing Center. And uh, <clears throat> um, it, I, because that's how I saw myself and that's how I wanted other people to see myself. But <clears throat> uh, our, our credentials come in different forms. They can come in the form of a job title, marital status, educational degree, organizations we belong to. And for me, it was mainly about <clears throat> external recognition. So when I'm seeking credentials, um, I'm doing it to wear as a badge that others recognize <laughs> and admire. <laughs> um, so the belief that I need validation by others and uh, that's, that's why I put uh, a lot of eyes in this particular piece. It's, um, it's uh, wearing a credential for others to see. <clears throat> and that becomes part of my identity. In this uh, carving also, there are, uh, there are human profiles that aren't quite finished. They're, they're missing the eyes or they're missing some other some other thing in themselves. The next frame is about wealth and uh, the, the motive I saw uh, for seeking wealth was seeking security. Um, I got these mixed up here. Excuse me a minute. The, uh, the, the carving represents a, um, a, um, a carved chest, like you see many of these bentwood chests up here. And these chests were made to store valuable items um, such as regalia, uh, food, so they, were, they were storage for food, um, and a tuu which is another word for our sacred clan property. They, they were meant to hold valuable things. And of course, this chest is empty. Um, I, <clears throat> while I was carving it, I, I remembered uh, wh when I think of wealth, I like to think of opposites also. And, and when I was carving it, it reminded me of a question I got from a tourist who was visiting this museum where I used to work in visitor services. And she asked me if the people in the impoverished villages were miserable. And <clears throat> she said she read that uh, poverty was uh, a real problem in Alaska villages. And my response was, um, money doesn't always make people happy. And, and they're able to live subsistence lifestyles. And in the small villages, they're probably living more traditionally and that uh, brings a person a feeling of fulfilling this. And uh, so I, th I thought of that story while I was carving this. Um, and and it, so that made me question, what is true wealth? What does wealth mean to us? In a capitalist society, we're taught that our lives <clears throat> are about making money and climbing the ladder and having plenty. And that plentiness never seems to be enough. This, this next one I, uh, I, I carved to represent status and it represents a shaki at. Um, if you, for those of you who don't know what that is, there these um, these um, I, I don't want to call it a hat. They, you wear them on your head, and they have ermines flowing down the back, and uh, <clears throat> and they have uh, walrus whiskers coming out the top. They used to fill them with eagle down. To do peace dance and, and shake the shake the shakiat so the feathers would uh, float over 
the audience, the eagle was a symbol of peace. But um, the shakiats, uh, to me, they represent a certain kind of status. And I thought that would be a, a good way to symbolize status on here. Uh, there's there's, <clears throat> there's a lot of uh, um, abalone on those shakiat frontlets. And at they ha usually have uh, um, something carved in the middle. And this one, of course, has nothing in the middle. The designs, you, if you can make out these designs, uh, they're actually carved backwards. You can't tell from here, from a two-dimensional picture, but out in the gallery, um, <clears throat> the concave parts are convex. The parts that are meant to be carved are uncarved, and, and so it's carved backwards. And the designs don't mean anything. They just float on the on the uh, surface of the on the surface of the uh, picture frame. The the next one is uh, r represents um, a search for uh, or an attraction to religion in a search for purpose. So because um, because when I write about uh, religious um, priests or, or whatever coming to Alaska to uh, change our native ways, in my poems, I always refer to them as men in black. <laughs> and, and so uh, I, I decided to use a black, uh, black stain on this one. This figure on the top, his eyes are closed as if he's sleeping. So you can interpret this uh, any way you want. I have multiple interpretations that could be either a God who's sleeping or a person who's praying, trying to, trying to affect uh, the, some kind of fate. And to me, that, uh, that sounds like some kind of magic. And uh, prayers can be some kind of incantation. So I put, uh, I put celestial figures on here. On each side of the frame, there's uh, these half faces. They're, they're moons and stars. And uh, down at the bottom is a sun figure with a, a gold halo around. <clears throat> and that's supposed to um, uh, represent iconology, like the Russian icons, a lot of gold in, in the Russian icons. So I wanted this to, uh, to have elements of uh, religious icons, um, but also to, uh, to mesh both religion and magic to affect outcomes. Uh, this, this one here, consumption uh, <clears throat> originally I was going to have a string of red beads hanging down from the hand and feeding the mouth and that would be uh, perpetually feeding itself always putting something always consuming something and then the hand on the right is uh, meant to be taking something so always consuming, always taking, consume, take, consume, take. And uh, we, we seem to live that way in a society where we think uh, there's so much abundance. Um, and uh, the, uh, the color I chose for this, there's an odd story behind that. <clears throat> the, uh, Gorging ourselves with food is one form of consumption and made me think of the Roman vomitariums. So I chose a vile color. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> but there's many, many kinds of uh, consumption 
we consume to excess uh, television and media, uh, food, fossil fuels, alcohol and drugs. And uh, so the question I ended up asking myself after, after I carved each one of these is, uh, is why? Why do I do that? So this is really an examination of motives and uh, it really comes down to values. Uh, so for me, it was more like values clarification. I didn't even have to pay tuition. <clears throat> um, technology. When I think of technology, I think of high tech. Uh, uh, there's technology is a real broad word. Like we use that word in this museum a lot when we're talking about the technology of uh, people or we have tool technology um, <clears throat> and, uh, and various other technologies. But it, I'm addressing our uh, <clears throat> 21st century high tech. And it, it's, our, it's our new means of communication. We, we text, we do social media, uh, teleconference and it's become important to have friends on Facebook and, uh, <clears throat> and it feels like connection, but that's the, the, that's the catch. It feels like connection. But to me, uh, technology is really creating disconnection. I, I think uh, when we settle for technology, we're we're settling for a uh, a uh, image of the world instead of in, instead of uh, being in the world, and so this the, uh, the designs on this frame are represent our senses, and they're all disconnected from each other. So here's our sense of taste, uh, hearing, smell, and uh, and these uh, abalone at the bottom actually represent ones and zeros, uh, the ones and zeros in programming. The next one is about addiction. Um, it, it's another, another form of uh, filling ourselves. Uh, and, and when we do that too much and too often, we become addicted to different things. And uh, the images I have here, this mouth on top is addiction itself, um, ready to devour someone. Um, the hands are, uh, are hands reaching up out of quagmire. And if you look really closely, you can see red beads that's supposed to represent the droplet of blood. Uh, I, I think of uh, people in addiction as a form of crucifixion. And that, so that's uh, that imagery there. And uh, the round figures on the bottom are, uh, are, are um, demons and the, the uh, square faces are people in coffins. Now the paintings are, tell a, a reverse story. The, the carvings tell about emptiness. And you notice that uh, as I examined each one of those things, the different kinds of emptiness have almost all have to do with uh, physical, the, something physical, the external. And the paintings, as I go through the paintings, it's more about fulfillingness and that's all internal. Um, <clears throat> so I had, uh, I had some influences before I started painting. Uh, <clears throat> I, Jim Shopert has always been a hero of mine. And uh, early on, I was really afraid to branch out and uh, experiment with my own styles. And, uh, and Jim Shopert came to a class uh, 
when I was taking an art class uh, at Sheldon Jackson College. He came into Linda Larson's class as a, a guest speaker and uh, he was watching me painstakingly do my, my, uh, my hard edge form line. It has to be just perfect. And he grabbed my arm and he started making me paint these wild things. And he said, loosen up. And, uh, you know, that just made me really conscious of how deliberate I, I was forcing myself to be and, <clears throat> and how locked into a style I was. So that did, <clears throat> that was a turning point for me. Um, it helped me uh, uh, feel okay about practicing things that all my life I just considered doodling. I've always been doing the kind of really wild artwork that you see out there, but I just didn't, uh, I just didn't do them as something that I thought should be in public. But these artists uh, uh, affected me, oops. And uh, this next one is uh, Donnie Varnell. I'm a real fan of Donnie Varnell as well. He does these really wild, uh, you can see uh, you can see how this originates out from our old form line style. You can see uh, um, suggestions of an ovoid here, a black ovoid, and these here are actually squared off uh, U shapes. But um, this was Donnie Varnell's first piece I ever saw. It's called Logic Board. And I thought, wow, people are doing cool things with our art. And it just made me want to do that too. And then finally, um, for, <clears throat> for a color scheme, um, I forgot to dig it out. There's a book, uh, a children's book that we keep here. And I don't know the illustrator's name, but uh, I, the uh, colors in here, I was real impressed by. And, and the, um, the ability to use uh, non-traditional colors and still have them come out so beautifully. I like that, I like those color schemes. So I started uh, purchasing some uh, colors that are not just our regular uh, black <clears throat> uh, iron oxide or, or the blue green color. And um, the, the um, <clears throat> an another, Another person who influenced me a lot was Norm Campbell, a local artist here. I don't know if you folks have seen his work. If you haven't, uh, look in the, the city library downtown and up along the ceiling of uh, and then almost an entire wall, he, he did this uh, really detailed pencil or pen and ink drawing. It's really cool. But I took a beginning drawing class from him a few years back and uh, and started uh, practicing shading and uh, and from him I got the idea of of uh, developing designs more organically in other words uh, what he showed me he said often when he doesn't start off with an idea he'll just start sketching from a corner of his uh, of his paper and uh, and it becomes whatever it becomes. So as I worked on some of these paintings, I did the same thing. I, I always had the th a theme in my head, but I let the design shape itself. Um, this is a, this, this uh, drawing on the left is going to be a huge carving. Um, it, it's, uh, I'm not sure what it is, but but that's uh, the the style I like to work in nowadays. And uh, <clears throat> the the paintings on the right, uh, this is my more traditional style. It's a raven on top. Uh, these these are actually the uh, the bird people, the sea people, and the land people. And then the painting below it is an interpretation of the one above using the style that I now feel uh, comfortable in. And uh, 
I, I design both. I feel comfortable doing both our traditional and my own style. Um, <clears throat> this one here, I call it the spirit version of the other one. That's what it feels like when I when I'm uh, designing organically. It feels like something spiritual. So the paintings. Um, <laughs> this first one. <clears throat> the reason I call it oneness is uh, is because when when I am out in the world and and I'm feeling complete. Uh, I feel like I'm not in nature. I feel like I'm of nature, that I'm not observing, that I'm participating. And uh, <clears throat> so all the images in this picture have to do with, uh, with all the different um, peoples that are populating the earth which is the sky people, where's my cursor? The sky people, this is an abstract bird and his claw and there's another wing. And the sea people, this one here, he's upside down. This is the fish tail and this is his uh, fin on the back. I gave him a human hand for his fin. And uh, and uh, this one here is the human. Robert, yeah. Where are you pointing? Oh, is it not? Is the mouse not showing? Oh, shucks. Um, well, I've pointed it out to our Zoom audience, and then the bottom image is uh, is an animal. So, well, that's good to know. Yeah, so this is the sky people, and this is a human, this is a wing, and this is the fish. That's his tail, uh, the, the fin on his back, and his other fin, which I drew as a human hand. And then uh, this one's a bear, his, uh, his claws, giant claws, pretty abstract. So being at one with all our brethren. <clears throat> this one is called everything. Uh, it, it's a pretty busy design. This is one of the ones that I started designing from the corner. Um, <laughs> I was just gonna use my mouse again. <clears throat> Pardon? Oh, you did? No, I don't see it. Where in the heck is it? Huh. Oops. Ah, uh, what the heck? <clears throat> well, I started from the bottom right and I designed that triangular shape first, the red triangular shape. And then I, I put the circle in the middle and I, I thought of putting a uh, fetus in there, but I just put uh, a different, uh, something that could represent a fetus, um, something being born, something in a womb. And then all those other odd shapes, like the, um, like the uh, series of, uh, of little dots um, that progressively get smaller. Um, I, I put those here and there to balance out the design. Um, there's, there's colors you can see in here that uh, I got from the palette of that children's book. Um, I really like this color scheme, but it's, it's quite abstract. Um, <clears throat> there's, I wish I could find my cursor. You can see it, but I can't. How weird. Huh. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll come out there and I'll point out different things to you. Sorry, Zoom audience. <laughs> this is a hand. 
um, a wing of sorts, a person upside down. Um, and this is a something like a bird's head, I don't know, uh, a mouse, uh, another hand, another wing, um, just piece, pieces of uh, animals, and then a figure on the, a humanoid figure on the bottom. I don't know what he's saying. That's a that's a um, like a thought balloon, except a speech balloon. But I got to figure out what he's saying. And then uh, this is one whole section I did all at once. Uh, you can see a hand here and uh, a head here. This is an eye with all those black things coming off it. And then uh, the different creatures in here. But uh, I don't know where the design came from. And uh, I just like to um, settle for the feeling it gives me as I'm doing these things. Like I said, it feels quite spiritual and, uh, and it does feel like I'm being in everything when, when I'm designing these things. The, this uh, next to last one is, is uh, spirit. <laughs> I just learned how to do gold foil this year. So I, 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 uh, this piece, I started off with the circles in the center <clears throat> and they're, uh, they're offset from each other a little bit to, uh, to give uh, some sort of tension. And then the, the three abalones and the gold circle, uh, again, that's supposed to represent something celestial, um, something universe to do with the universe. And then all the rest of it um, is one one being. It's uh, I don't know what it is. Um, the, these designs just come to me, but uh, but the idea of um, of just being is embedded in this in this uh, design. This piece. Um, was was purchased uh, for the Sheldon Jackson collection by the <laughs> by the friends of Sheldon Jackson, and uh, it's called Introspection. It's it, it's got that long yellow streak uh, going across the design, and it cuts into another blue shape. And again, I, I really like designing. Um, uh, creatures or humanoid figures in a womb. And so that's supposed to be a, a person who's entered a womb. And, uh, and that's what I think of when, when I think about introspection. It's a place to go um, and, and it's a place that, uh, <clears throat> that suddenly feels very, very, um, oh, it, it it feels like a puzzle that that uh, that we go inward to start to put a puzzle together. So this really busy this really busy um, design is like putting a puzzle together. <clears throat> it doesn't the 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 individual pieces don't represent anything specific. They're mostly. Um, mostly uh, design contortions. I, I like to take our design forms and, uh, and put them in, together in ways where there's a lot of ambiguity and, and they're uh, quite abstract. So a lot of these shapes, as you, the longer you look at it, the more you start to see creatures or body parts, and just when you start to think you see a, that it's representing something, you realize that it doesn't. <laughs> when, when, I, when I was first coming up with, uh, with ideas for each picture frame and the theme for the show, um, as I began to realize that, um, the idea behind emptiness and fulfillingness 
uh, really has something to do with my spirit, but it also has to do with the uh, cultural values that we grow up with. And, uh, and a number of years back, Walter Soboloff Sr. Uh, outlined what he thought our Schlingit values were. And so I just thought I'd end with those here. Um, the, like I said, this, this show, uh, this exhibition isn't meant to, uh, to uh, it wasn't made for a small audience. I, I really want the themes to be universal. And uh, that doesn't mean that you have to live by our cultural values that uh, Dr. Soboloff outlined. But, um, but I think that, um, <clears throat> that there are so many movements out there um, to change the world, uh, to, to better the way things are. But as I was doing this, I realized that um, if I'm trying to change the world, that's pretty, uh, uh, pretty haughty of me to think I can do that. And the best change for me to look at is uh, how to change myself for the better. So I hope you find meaning in this, in this show, in the pieces, um, and find things you can relate to. And uh, I do wanna thank you all for being here today. And uh, thank the, <clears throat> I wanna thank Jackie for uh, all the work she does here in, in uh, putting the programs together and the staff for helping set up and, <clears throat> and uh, the, the friends of Sheldon Jackson you know, there's <clears throat> there's a lot of work that goes into these uh, into these programs, and and uh, I, I really appreciate uh, an opportunity to uh, benefit from that and, and share some of my thoughts and ideas and artwork with you. Thank you. Are there any questions? I can. <clears throat> yeah, the top one says respect for self and others, including elders. Remember our native traditions, our families, sharing, loyalty, pride, and loving children. Responsibility, truth, and use and wise use of words. Oops. Uh, care of subsistence areas, care of property, reverence. We have one great word in our culture, Hashagania. This was a great spirit above us. And today we have translated that reverence to God. He said, Walter Sobel, a sense of humility, care of human body, dignity, and the word for dignity is yan god dunik. Are there more below that? That's it, I think. Oh, okay, I can't see that on here. Oh, well. <laughs> Are there any questions? I've got a question, Robert. You, you said that you you like to begin some of your sketching and drawing from the lower corner, just like you learned from Campbell. Do you ever proceed with your carvings that way, or is that a different process? Well, that's going to give me something interesting to try. <laughs> I haven't done a carving that way yet, <clears throat> but, but now it's going to be lodged in there as my next idea or your next idea. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I have another idea for a value on that scroll because that's what I see here going from the traditional, and you said it yourself, very strictness to become a little looser and then to really uh, go beyond those um, ancient tradition and, and 
basically liberate yourself and go free, free spirit. And it's, I think it's very cool, like adopting those other colors and, and uh, you use the term abstract a few times. And so there is definitely a path there. And I find it very inspiring, interesting. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? No, Robert, can we ask people on Zoom if they have anything to ask? And um, in the meantime, while you're checking that, was this, this is a, kind of a really personal question, but was this kind of a cathartic experience for you to make this entire series, you know, that's so well balanced between this and being this fulfillment and reflecting back on your life? and your experiences and your relationships with your father and your mother and people around you? Well, um, it's actually a review of that cathartic process. The cathartic process for me took place, uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm just gonna disclose to you, it's, uh, it's not our big secret that I spent many years going down a destructive path of uh, drinking and drugging. And, uh, <clears throat> and my catharsis came from uh, learning a, a different program of living. And that's what I think when, uh, you know, it's available to everyone. We can always examine ourselves and we can always um, examine our motives and, and, uh, and look for a, a more fulfilling way of living. Um, and like you were just saying, um, <clears throat> we're we're not locked into uh, we're not locked into the way things currently are. There, there's always opportunity for change, um, and uh, you know, like uh, like when I thought I was locked into just doing our trad old classical form line, they call it. Um, I'm from a generation where uh, there weren't that many. Uh, native artists practicing the art. So um, when, when the art form was still being revived, there was real worry that uh, it should, it, the old classical form should be practiced and taught um, so it doesn't disappear. <clears throat> but no, there's so many artists who uh, understand the classical art form so well, and they're branching out and doing all this experimental work. But that's, uh, that's because art changes along with the times, <clears throat> we're, we're not locked into, uh, we're not stuck is what I mean to say. Uh, and if you feel stuck, that could be a good thing. That's a, a crux for change. I hope I don't sound pedantic or preachy either. These are life lessons that, uh, that I just wanted to illustrate. <laughs> questions on Zoom or one more from the audience? I don't have a question, but I have a comment. Uh -huh. um, and I'll say it and click it because that's what I'm practicing. Okay. Uh, think it away. Your work your pictures, and even you remind me of Clinker Picasso <laughs> because you piece the different body parts, the hand, the head, the eyes, everywhere, instead of a whole figure. Ah, I think it's amazing. Thank you. I'm not the only Picasso out there, <laughs> but but it's but thank you. I appreciate that uh, those those observations. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a beautiful art form to uh, be involved in. It's a beautiful life to be involved in, <laughs> and um, I need to ask one of the staff to look at this because this I can't find the cursor, and this machine is going to try to restart. Oh yeah, let's see. Let me exit out of this thing here. Well, it won't restart for six hours, so we might be okay. Okay, and so, then because yeah. I can't see the cursor, I can't uh, turn on 
or I can't ask right. uh, the Zoom audience if they have questions, or should we just do it by chat? We could do it by chat, and I can see if there's anything. But, but I don't see. Oh, there it is. Could you? Oh, yeah, there it is now. Interesting. Okay, so is the, we have one question on Zoom. <clears throat> is the ovoid form the basis of clinket design, and does it have a meaning? as the fount of design that it springs from. <clears throat> and the answer to that is uh, the ovoid is one of the elements that, uh, that composes a, uh, a slinget design in form um, I, I recommend picking up Bill Holmes' book. Uh, um, uh, Jan, do you know the title of it offhand? So, something on an, 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 well, Northwest Coast, Indian art and analysis of form. It explains all these different uh, elements, design elements. And also there are a lot of uh, local classes um, uh, where, you can, where you can learn these, uh, the basic elements of this art form. The, the shapes themselves uh, don't have meaning. Um, where, where the shapes derived from is all conjecture, but, but, uh, <clears throat> but it's, um, it's evolved into a really, a really sophisticated uh, kind of expression, and it continues to evolve. Thank you for that question. Are there any other questions from the Zoom audience? You can, uh, if you have questions, you can type it in chat. It doesn't look like there are any other questions. So I want to thank everybody for coming today, uh, both audiences. Thank you. If you're here, please enjoy the show. And if you're not here, I hope you can make it at some point to come see it. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, Mr. Hoffman. <laughs> you're welcome, Mr. Hoffman. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, good, thank you. <laughs>